Greetings, I'm David Beckman, and this is the message that I gave at our Evensong two days ago, May the 20th, for Redeemer Anglican Church here in Chattanooga. The text is from Luke chapter 11, beginning in the 14th verse, going to verse 28. I'll stop with, uh, let's see here, verse 26. So let me read the text, and then uh, we'll have the homily uh, as we continue to celebrate the ascension. And he was casting out a devil, and it was dumb. And it came to pass, when the devil was gone out, the dumb spake, and the people wondered. But some of them said, He casteth out devils through Beelzebub, the chief of the devils. And others, tempting him, sought of him a sign from heaven. They were always doing that, weren't they? But he, knowing their thoughts, said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and a house divided against a house falleth. And if Satan also be divided against himself, how shall his kingdom stand? Because ye say that I cast out devils through Beelzebub. And if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, then by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. But if I with the finger of God cast out devils, no doubt the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man armed keepeth his palace, his goods are in peace. But when a stronger than he shall come upon him and overtake him or overcome him, he taketh from him all his armor wherein he trusted and divideth his spoils. He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places seeking rest and finding none. He saith, I will return into my house whence I came out. And when he cometh, he findeth it swept and garnished. Then goeth he, and taketh to him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and meditations of our heart be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Through Jesus Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. We continue at this time to celebrate the ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ to his position at the right hand of God, having all authority in heaven and earth. From his throne he exercises that authority and he continues to gather his people to himself, his church, and thus increase the extent of his kingdom. And as we read in the Gospel of Luke, while facing opposition to his good work in those days, Jesus spoke of his kingdom to his opponents exposing the contradiction that they'd gotten themselves into by saying he was casting out devils because he was himself serving the devil. He then went on to say in verse 20, But if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. And as he often did, Jesus told the unbelievers that if they wanted evidence that he was indeed the Messiah, then just look at his works, look at what he did. And in this case, he's casting out demons. And everyone was amazed at how easily and simply he did it. Here was plenty of evidence that he had total authority over the powers of darkness, for who else could have authority like his, demonstrated in the way that he demonstrated it, but the Messiah whom the prophets had foretold. But in this case of saying, look at my works, Jesus says something unusual about his works he says he is doing it, doing what he is doing by the finger of God. Now that is an unusual expression in the Bible. It occurs in three places in the Old Testament, twice concerning God's writing the Ten Commandments on the stone tablets, and then there was the time when the sorcerers of Egypt tried to convince Pharaoh that the miracles being done against them, which were destroying the place, were not some magician's trick but the actual work of God. We read in Exodus chapter 8, 18 and following, The magicians tried by their secret arts to produce the gnats, but they could not. So there were gnats on man and beast. And then the magician said to Pharaoh, This is the finger of God. But Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he would not listen to them. Now, by using this expression, the finger of God, Jesus is echoing the, it, the Exodus story. And he is saying that he is establishing his kingdom by the same power that delivered Israel out of Egypt, the finger of God. 
So then when Jesus goes on to speak about the strong man in his own palace that's overcome by a stronger man, his use of the phrase, the finger of God, reminds us what he had done to Pharaoh and his house in the past. But now, as he casts out these demons, he is saying he's using that same finger of God in their day to overthrow another strong man. Instead of Pharaoh this time, he's overthrowing the power of the devil over the human race, spoiling the possessions of the devil, which is the souls of the people under his control. And just as the Passover was the straw that broke Pharaoh's back, Jesus' death and resurrection, he who is the true Passover lamb, would be the final blow to the devil's power. Now, how is that? Well, the way the devil has kept people under his control is through the fear of death. That's the chain that he has kept around the necks of people. But we read in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 and following, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through the death, through death, he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. And so the incarnate Son of God wrecked and spoiled the devil's kingdom by redeeming his people on the cross rising from the dead so that they don't have to be afraid of dying anymore. And this work of his is what was promised in the very first prophecy of his coming. That promise was given to the serpent in Genesis 3.15 where God said, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. There you go. The Presbyterian theologian John Murray writes, quote, It is most significant that the work of Christ, which is so central in our Christian faith, is essentially a work of destruction that terminates upon the power and the work of Satan. This is not a peripheral or incidental feature of redemption. It is an integral aspect of its accomplishment. It is surely significant that the first promise of redemptive grace, the first beam of redemptive light that fell upon our fallen first parents, was in the terms of destruction of the tempter. Of course, the devil, just like Pharaoh, tries to fight on, but also like Pharaoh, his struggle is in vain. Pharaoh lost his army in the sea. Jesus says of his own personal kingdom, Matthew 16, 18, I will build my church. And the gates of hell are not going to prevail against it. So then, having proven the absurdity of his opponent's accusation, and also revealed something of the nature of his kingdom, which we have been looking at just now, Jesus adds something in verse 23. He says this, throws this in. He that's not with me is against me. He that gathers not with me scatters. Now the Jews accusing him were not with him, obviously. In fact, they were with the devil. And they were also trying to discourage people from believing in him, and so they were scattering his sheep. So when Jesus says this, these words are warning to his accusers, because if they keep opposing him, and they oppose, they oppose the one who's going to judge them on the last day from his great throne. So, it's a warning. But these words in verse 23 also apply to all of us disciples, don't they? I mean, aren't they a challenge to us? Obviously, Jesus is wanting people to have a decided commitment to him and also to be joining with him in the extension of his kingdom by helping to gather in the sheep. And I find it interesting that if you take what he says about the kingdom, you know, with the finger of God and so forth, and you take these two challenges to be decidedly his disciple and to help gather in the sheep, the result of all this looks very much like the Great Commission. Let me show you. Uh, let's, let me read the Great Commission again in Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20, and we'll notice this. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Now there's his kingdom, right? Which he fought the devil to establish. Verse 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, 
teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Now, here is the ingathering of the sheep. And then he ends with the words, And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. And here is the personal commitment. He speaks of being with us, but he is, of course, with those who are with him. He is with all of them that would stand with him for his kingdom. And what this comparison of Luke 11 and Matthew 28 tells us is that one of the best ways that we can celebrate Christ's ascension is to renew our commitment to the Great Commission. Certainly we adore Him and worship Him and celebrate as we do in our services. But then, starting from this position of victory over the devil that Jesus worked, indwelt by the Holy Spirit that He has poured out upon us from His throne, let us boldly take our stand with Him in this world. And let us extend the reach of His kingdom by gathering His sheep furthering the work of discipling the nations as each of us has opportunity and gift. And as we do so, we have that wonderful promise, Lo, I am with you to the end of the age. Amen. God bless you.